Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm here tonight to introduce Professor Richard Wolf and the video DVD, Capitalism Hits the Fan. Uh, professor Wolf has taught economics. He's been a professor of economics for many years at the University of Massachusetts. He currently teaches economics at the New School here at the Graduate Program for International Affairs. He also teaches regularly at the Brecht Forum and speaks constantly on the radio. He's publishing things blogs, conferences, and newspapers. You can follow up with all his news on his website. You can also see him speak at the Left Forum, which is a very large conference down here at Pratt in a couple of weeks. That's March 19th. There's information about that outside. Um, so tonight, what we'll be doing is showing a shortened version of this DVD, Capitalism Hits the Fan. And then Rick will talk for a few moments before opening it up to any questions or ans and have answers for your questions. So think about things that you'd like to ask him as you're watching the presentation. So thank you for coming and enjoy this presentation. As soon as I can hit play. Is the lighting okay for everyone? It seems all right. It's another sign of the nation's weakening economy. This is the most severe economic crisis of capitalism in my lifetime. Which means, as I look around the room, in yours as well. And it has to be understood and approached in that framework if it's going to be taken seriously and if people are going to have a reasonable shot at coming out on the other end of this process um, in something less than a devastated personal social situation. So let me start by suggesting to you some things that this economic crisis is not. It's not a financial crisis, notwithstanding that that name is used all the time. To call it a financial crisis limits it in ways that make no sense. As you will see, this crisis comes out of the entire economic system we have here in the United States. It didn't start with banking, it didn't stay in the realm of banking, and it will not be limited at any time and in any significant way to the credit markets or to banking or insurance companies. The second thing it isn't is temporary or fleeting or short. That's a wishful thinking, a little bit like imagining the crisis is limited to finance is wishful thinking. Uh, let me illustrate that with two historical parallels to keep in mind. First, we had another great crisis back in the 1930s. Let's remember what that was like since the current one is rightfully being compared to that one. That one blew, exploded in 1929. For the next 10 years, from 1929 to 1939, two presidents, Hoover and Roosevelt, tried a variety of monetary and fiscal policies, many looking exactly like what you see today in Washington. And they didn't work. And for 10 years, we could not get out of that depression. And what finally lifted us out was not some clever policy. It was a major change in the society called World War II. And in case you think these kinds of long-lasting recessions and depressions that are immune to policy only happened long ago, let me give you another example. In 1989, Japan, the second most important industrial country in the world, then and now, it encountered a downturn, severe. And here we are 18 years later and the Japanese have still not emerged from that depression. 
even though they tried every monetary and fiscal policy in their repertoire, which includes everything that Mr. Paulson or Mr. Bernanke have so far tried. The third thing it isn't is quickly and easily fixable. We've already seen that. Starting with the Bear Stearns events last summer, we have seen the United States government try one policy after another, lowering interest rates, pumping more money into the economy. Every one of those policies failed. Every one was introduced with great fanfare as the solution for this troubling problem. Each successive step was larger than the one before, signaling the failure of the one before. Something much bigger, something much more far-reaching is going to have to be done. So let me begin by telling you what I understand to be the historical framework out of which this crisis comes. And I think you need to see it historically to get a sense of how big it is, how profound it is, how serious this is. To do this, let's go back briefly to the period from 1820 to 1970, 150 years that are astonishing in the world and in our country. Here's how and why it's astonishing. Over that period, every decade, from 1820 to 1970, every decade, the American working people enjoyed a rising level of wages. It's astonishing. It's probably the only society in the history of the world that can say that. It made the United States remarkable. It's also a time in which workers became more productive. More machines were provided for each worker. Training was provided. Speed was demanded. Workers became more productive. But they got something for their extra hard work and their greater productivity. They got a rising standard of living. Americans as a people began to internalize this remarkable historical experience. Therein lie the roots of the notion sometimes called American exceptionalism, that there's something unique about America, that there's something built in to the United States about a rising standard of living. And so it becomes reasonable to measure your own worth as a person, your own success, in terms of the clothing you can buy and the house you can live in and the car you can drive, the measure of yourself becomes this achievable, remarkable quality of American life. That's why this is the country in which advertising is born and becomes something that we can give the rest of the world, perhaps a dubious gift. But we're the society of consumption, par excellence, the model for the rest of the world to this day. OK, let me turn then to the trauma that afflicts a population that has internalized and come to expect 150 years of rising standard of living in which workers every decade could enjoy more because their wages rose and their wages allowed them to buy more. And they understood work more and more as that which allowed you then to go out and buy. In the 1970s, that history of the United States stopped. Real wages stopped rising in the 1970s, and they have never resumed since. This is a fundamental change in the United States, which the majority of our people probably have not yet come to terms with. So I'm going to look at it now by telling the story in two parts. I'm going to first look at how working people coped with the end of rising wages. And then I'm going to look at how the business community coped with it. 
Because in their two responses, the ingredients for the crisis we're now in will be laid bare. So let's start with the people. What did the American working class of people do now that their wages stopped rising? First, the American working people did more work. You know, if the wages you get per hour are fixed, don't go up anymore, one solution is more hours. Have more people in the house going out for more hours, which is what the American working class did. Between the 1970s and today, the average number of hours worked per year by an American rose by about 20%. <clears throat> That's a lot. We work 20% more hours on the job than we did 30 years ago. By comparison, for example, if you look at France, Germany, and Italy, over the same period of time, the average number of hours worked by those folks dropped by 20%. The hope of the American family was by sending everybody out many hours, it would allow rising consumption. The hope proved unfounded. Why? It turns out that if you're working a lot of hours, you have to find other ways to solve the problems that used to be solved when you work. If the woman goes out of the house to take a, a job, she needs a set of clothes. She needs her own car, especially in a country that doesn't do well with mass transportation. It turns out that doing more work, uh, more hours, has costs attached to it that undercut the whole point of it, which was to bring in more money. It turns out there are more costs. So if it didn't solve the problem, what was the second thing that the American working class did to cope? with the end of the rising wages, so that they could continue to consume? Well, you all know the answer. The answer is that the American working class proceeded, starting in the 1970s, to go on a borrowing binge that no other working class in any country at any time in the history of this race, the human race, ever did before. Americans started borrowing. At first, of course, they borrowed in the way that the lender prefers. They offered collateral. So the basic way the Americans solved the problem was to borrow against the house. To borrow a lot against the house. Keep in mind that the crisis exploded around something called a mortgage, the subprime mortgage. But the American working class could never have increased its consumption simply by borrowing against the house. They basically didn't have enough wealth to borrow enough. Something had to be invented, a way to lend to the American people massive amounts of money with no collateral at all. And that way was found. It's in your wallet. It's called a credit card. It is a mechanism to allow banks to lend to the working class with no collateral at all. It's unsecured debt in economic terms, your credit card. But of course, no lender will lend to you without collateral unless there's something in it for them to do that risky thing. And the answer is the rate of interest. What is the average rate of interest on a credit card today? Ready? 18% per year. That's why there are credit cards. So the American working class was given loans, hundreds of billions of dollars in unsecured credit in order to allow the rise in consumption. And the American working class did it. They went for it. Stressed, exhausted. This is a population that has reached the limits. It cannot carry more debt, and it can't do more work. 
That's why this is not a temporary problem. This is not a blip along the way. We have reached the limits of the kind of capitalism this society has become. Let me turn now to the business community, what they do. Well, for the business community, the last 30 years have been spectacular. Everything I've told you about the working class, now we're going to go the good news. With the introduction of computers, American workers became more and more productive. We had a 30-year period of rising labor productivity. But now stay with me. Each year the worker produces more, and what do you pay the worker each year? The same. That's what no more rising wages means. The workers get paid the same, the same, the same. They produce more and more and more, but they get the same, the same. That is the gap between what the workers produce for their employer, which the employer sells, and what they have to pay the worker to do it. The gap is getting bigger. What the workers get is flat, what they produce is more. That bigger, friends, is called profits. So the last 30 years of flat wages and rising productivity are the greatest profit boom in the history of American capitalism and quite possibly any capitalism. Profits boomed everywhere, not just on Wall Street, but right up and down Main Street too. This is not a crisis of Wall Street. This is not Wall Street doing something that Main Street is left out of. Not at all. This is a crisis of a system that is as busy on Wall Street as it is on Main Street. Every employer on Main Street participated in this dream. This is an employer's fantasy come true. I paid my workers the same, and they work more and more for me. They produce more and more for me, and I don't have to give them more at all. This, this can't be real. Pinch myself. It was. And it produced in the business community a kind of wild euphoria. Nobody could quite understand it. As the 70s became the 80s, and the 80s became the 90s, the profits were unbelievable. They began paying themselves levels of wages and bonuses nobody ever heard of before. Large corporations paid their people tens, hundreds of millions of dollars in annual salaries. Where'd that money come from? I just told you. What else did they do? They began to go through an orgy of something that's called mergers and acquisitions. They bought each other. Companies had huge amounts of money and bought other companies. Are you annoyed by a competitor? Buy them. Are you troubled by a foreigner who's stealing your market? Buy them. And you had the money to do it. What else did they do? Interesting. They put their money in a bank. And the bank suddenly discovered wild amounts of money coming in from corporations. Deposited in the banks, what you do with your profits while you're figuring it out. What else to do with them? You put them in the bank. And the banks became repositories of enormous amounts of money. And then the corporations and the banks, about the same time, discovered a remarkable thing that they could do with these profits. They would lend them to the employees. That is, the way that the employees could raise their consumption when their wages didn't go up anymore was to borrow the money that their frozen wages made possible to their employers. To understand the American economy in the last 30 years then amounts to this. Employers no longer raise the wages of their workers. Instead, they lent them the money. That's why it's an employer's fantasy come true.
instead of raising my workers' wages, I lend him the money, which he has to pay me back with interest. Isn't that better than paying them wages? This is, this is nirvana, or as close as business gets to nirvana. And so the American business community, directly or through the banks, got into the business of lending. You all know that corporation, or some of you can remember it, General Motors, famous for producing automobiles. Over the last 30 years, General Motors became a very different entity. It created a subsidiary called GMAC. General Motors Acceptance Corporation. It is a bank. It lends money. It began by lending money to people to buy cars, because their wages couldn't pay for them. Then it discovered you could make more money off the interest of the loan than you could make profit from the car. And so General Motors became a bank became much more interested in being a bank than in being a car, something we now notice the results of. They don't make cars very well, but they're a great bank. Their only mistake was, about 10 years ago, they branched out. They were making so much money, and instead of just lending to people to buy cars, they became a general lender and went into the mortgage business. Wrong decision, wrong time. But General Motors has specialized in wrong decisions at the wrong time for 30 years. <laughs> Banks got into it, lending to everybody. We all became used to the following phenomena. I don't know about you, but I must get two to three solicitations for credit cards a week in the mail, none of which I request. It's so profitable to push debt on the American people that everybody does it. It is a society out of control. It is a, a profit bonanza looking for more ways to make money. And the financial sector on Wall Street responded to this situation. It didn't create it. It got its hands on the money and found new ways to lend new people new loans at high interest rate. This is a craziness. This is a wild out of control. But we shouldn't be surprised if we create an anomalous situation of exploding profitability on the one side and a desperate, exhausted population wanting and needing and measuring its own self in terms of rising consumption, we have a lethal combination. And so, of course, in the enthusiasm of business and the banks to lend the money and make more money in a time of so much money and $100 billion here and a $100 million executive package over there, we're surprised that they ended up lending to people who couldn't pay it back? Oh, come on. The history of capitalism is punctuated by booms and busts. Where do you think that word comes from? Boom and bust is built into this system. The only difference now is it comes at the end of this long historical period when it has reached its outer limits. So of course, in the rise of all this profit, we had what? We had the, I'll quote Mr. Greenspan, we had irrational exuberance. And first it expressed itself in one kind of lunacy and then another. This is the lunacy of the business community. Lunacy number one. In the 1990s, as these profits were building up, suddenly our business community decided that the new internet is going to revolutionize the universe. It really isn't just an expanded yellow pages. It's really a radically new thing. And so they invested in companies, funny companies with little names, usually two or three initials, companies that had been around three, four years, had never made any profit, and who said in their annual statements, we don't expect to make any profit for 10 years. Who cares? Their stocks were bid up to $500 a share. <laughs> 
And you all know what that was. That was the boom of the late 1990s. And in March and April of, this, of the year 2000, the stock market crashed. So terrifying was the collapse of the stock market in early 2000 that our government reacted in terror by saying, oh my god, the, company, the economy is going to fall apart. We have to save it by getting people to spend, so we're going to lower interest rates, which they did. We know what will happen if you lower all the interest rates. People will borrow like crazy. And they did. And what they spent their money on was housing. So after the collapse of the bubble of the of, uh, stock market, we had another bubble of real estate. It went crazy. Everybody buying housing, building housing everywhere. Cheap money to borrow, build, buy, build, buy. And now we have the collapse of the real estate bubble. And there's nothing left to bubble. <laughs> what are we going to do? There isn't anything. Stock market's a bit finished. Real estate is finished. And so we sit. A collapsed bubble, the wealthy having produced an armada of new instruments that are now not worth very much. So that our business community is aghast with staggering losses, and so in its own peculiar way has come to replicate the exhaustion and anxiety of the working class for different reasons. Heaven knows. But we have an economic landscape that is littered with corpses. So the question we can pose is, what might be done other than these attempts to stimulate that don't succeed, these attempts to bail out that don't seem to succeed, and now even these steps of government buying shares in the AIG and the banks that doesn't seem to succeed. I don't find it surprising, and I hope you don't, given the history and the whole context, why these small, hesitant, halting steps do not add up to a solution. And I'm not the only one who sees it. Many in Washington do as well. And they have begun to put their faith in something else. And it's an interesting story, and I want to conclude by trying to explain why it won't work either. This is the notion of regulation. And this notion works as follows. The argument is made that in the first 30 years after World War II, we lived in a coming out of, world, uh, out of the Great Depression. Uh, the regime of Roosevelt had, after all, introduced all kinds of regulations. And that's true. Regulations governing what banks could do. Regulation governing what boards of directors of corporations could do, should do, might do. Whole new institutions, social security, unemployment insurance. We never had that before. So there were lots of regulations that came out of the desperation of the Great Depression. And those regulations were in force from the 30s through the mid-70s. So that was a period of a regulated American capitalism. And so the argument goes, that was a good time. And what terrible thing happened was at the end of the 70s, beginning with Reagan, was an era of deregulation. So the argument goes, OK, our problem is just that we deregulated under Reagan Bush, Clinton, and Bush. And so now, maybe with Mr. Obama, the era of deregulation will be put behind us, and we will return to the re-regulated good old days brought back. Now, part of this is understandable. We did regulate out of the last Great Depression. But another part of it is blind. Let's see why. Those regulations that were put into effect by Roosevelt, and even some later, even by Truman, even by Kennedy, even by Johnson, 
those regulations did indeed limit, constrain what boards of directors of capitalist corporations could do. They did. But here's what they also did. They gave corporate boards of directors an immense and instantaneous incentive to defeat those regulations, to evade them every chance they had, to weaken them every chance they have, and when the political conditions were possible, to get rid of them. And those boards of directors went to work, having tried to prevent those regulations in the first place, they went to work to evade, weaken, and destroy them. The last 30 years were the success. They were finally politically powerful enough that they could get rid of most of them. In other words, to pass regulations while leaving in place the boards of directors of private corporations is a bizarre policy that guarantees that you've left in place the absolute sworn enemy of the regulations. But you've not just left in place people who want to undo the regulations. Let's remember what a board of directors is. The board of directors of a corporation are the group of people, usually numbering between 15 and 25 persons, into whose hands flow the profits of enterprise. So to regulate our kind of economic system is to impose limits and rules on a group of people with every incentive to undo them and all the resources needed to realize their incentives. So of course the regulations become a dead letter. It's as if you had mounted a military campaign, but you decided not to defeat the enemy, but to establish an awful lot of rules while allowing the enemy to have free supply lines from everywhere <laughs> needed to undo you. A general who did that would be sent to an insane asylum. If we're going to deal with this problem, we have finally to face, and here's my conclusion, that if we leave the structure of enterprise in our society unchanged, we will not be addressing what is at the base of this whole story. The conflictual relationship between the people who run the production enterprises of our society and the people who work in them. That's why the wages didn't go up anymore when it was possible not to do that. That's why debt was substituted for rising wages. That's why jobs were moved and destroyed. And that's why regulations are simply objects to be undone. So what is a possible solution? Imagine the difference if a new system of regulations, say passed by Mr. Obama, were to confront a different organization of production, one in which not a board of directors responsible to shareholders ran the business, but instead the people who worked in every business ran the business, because they all have to live with the consequences. Then you'd have people on the inside of every business partnering with the government to make sure that the point of the regulations was realized, rather than a group of people who would function to undo and thwart the whole point and purpose of the regulation. Why don't we ask that question? And I suggest we ask it because even though I, I'm aware it's a daring question, we are in daring times. We face some really heavy problems in our society. We don't have many choices. What else might be said for reorganizing our production system so that the people who work at an enterprise become their own board of directors? Many American workers, more than you might think, have already done what I'm describing. Over the last 30 years, every year, hundreds and in some years thousands of engineers 
in that little strip of land between San Francisco and San Jose called Silicon Valley have done the following interesting thing. They quit their jobs working for big companies like Cisco or IBM or any of those. And together with a few friends, having walked away from those jobs, they set up a little enterprise amongst themselves, working out of one of their garages. And here's how they ran their enterprise. We're all equal here. No one's a supervisor. No one's telling what else to do. We're going to do this all as a group. And from Monday to Thursday, we're going to make software programs the way we always did. But on Friday, we're going to come to work, and we're not going to open the laptops. We're not going to make software. On Friday, we sit around all day and have meetings because we're our own board of directors. We decide what to do with the profits we've earned. We decide what to do whether to change our technology, whether to have more people working here, whether to move to another part of the San Mateo community, or whatever. We are our own, our own board of directors. This has been going on for years. These people voted with their feet and their lives to leave one kind of organization of production and establish another. If we don't take basic steps of this sort to deal with a crisis that has built over this length of time in the depth and breadth of our economy, if we keep tinkering at the edges with our monetary system, because we need to call this a financial crisis rather than a crisis of capitalism, which is what it is, we will all be very sorry. So it depends on us whether we will have the strength and the daring to look at these problems in new ways and face the possibility of having to make radical changes. Thank you very much for your attention. Great. Thank you, everyone, for watching this. And now Rick will get up and talk for a few moments, and then we'll take your questions. Let me thank you first for uh, coming and say a few words about about the, that might interest you. Uh, in case you were planning to do something like this yourself. I have never been in a film before in my life. I have had nothing to do with video, DVDs, or anything else. Um, I was approached by a group of professionals who make these kinds of films. The group is called the Media Education Foundation. They have a website, www.mediaed.org. They make all kinds of films on all kinds of topics. They approached me and said that this crisis demanded a film, would I do it? And you saw uh, one result. It's a DVD that has two versions of this uh, film on it. One that you just saw is short, about 35 minutes, and another one is 55 minutes long. It has more bells and whistles. I didn't realize it until just tonight, but this one doesn't have the eerie music that the 50-minute the 55 minute one is punctuated by very well-crafted, scary music to get you, to get you into the mood. Um, it has been a very interesting learning experience for me. I've been a professor all my life, and therefore, uh, like folks in this business, I write articles and I've written quite a few books. Um, it's very humbling to produce a film like this and to discover oh, a, a footnote for you might be interested. The lecture you saw, is actually a filming of a live lecture, was given by me at Smith College in Northampton, Massachusetts uh, to a regular evening session that people were invited to. But it was done in November of 2008. So if you find much of this film relevant, then I get at least six points for having predicted pretty well. Uh, because most of what's in there is as valid today as it was way back then. Um, the, uh, the humbling experience I want to mention to you is that it's pretty clear to me, a little depressing, a little, it's clear to me, that I've reached more people with this DVD in a year and a half 
than with the 10 books and 50 or 100 articles I've written in the previous 30 years. It tells you something about the world, it tells you something about our culture, and it's something everybody ought to think about what that means in terms of the way we live and interact uh, with one another. It's also led, as Jen mentioned in her introduction, which was very sweet of her, um, it's led me to have a remarkable experience. People who talk like me have been able to function in American universities perfectly well. I've been a, I taught at Yale, I taught here at the City University of New York, at the University of Massachusetts, but we normally have a harder time getting out to the rest of the community that isn't in the colleges or the universities. However, once this film got out, and thanks, of course, to the underlying crisis that's changing America much more than I think most folks understand, I have done more public speaking, have been on more radio and television programs in the last 18 months than in the entirety of my life before that. And I did a lot of public speaking. I've been active all my life and been involved in political things and so on. So for me, it's been a, a transformation of my, uh, of my existence. I now do at least one radio or television program every week. And there are weeks in which I do three or four. And I don't just mean PBS or public radio. I'm talking about commercial stations. To give you an example, my last week, my last uh, radio program, was with a commercial AM station in Salt Lake City, Utah, where the person who interviewed me for an hour during rush hour, which if you know how radio works, is the best time to be. It's when everybody's listening, you know, in their car or something on their way home, uh, between I think five and six, their time out there in, in Utah. The interviewer introduces himself to me as a Republican and a Mormon uh, I am, as you may have guessed, neither. Um, <laughs> and uh, for the rest of the hour, uh, he and I agreed on virtually everything. And I said exactly to him what you heard. So that, that, that didn't happen to me before in my lifetime. Even in the 1960s, when I was very young and I was beginning to get active, I never had experiences like the ones that I'm having now. Uh, and I mentioned also, in case you're interested, that I once appeared last year on the Glenn Beck program, and he and I agreed on everything as well. We spent 10 minutes before 10 million Americans bashing Yale University for being an elite university that does not pay taxes to the local community in which it is located, which is a, an obscenity that all private schools participate in, but with institutions as rich as that, it, I don't know if you know, Yale is the third or fourth richest university in the world, and New Haven is among the 10 poorest cities in the United States. So you have a situation in which a poverty-stricken city, New Haven, where I lived for 30 years, I mean, I know it well, um, because I went to Yale, that's why I went to New Haven, and I taught at Yale. Uh, it's a very poor city, made all the poorer, because the richest landowner and the richest employer and the richest citizen of the community doesn't pay taxes. It is Robin Hood in the reverse. When, some, when there's a, a, a fire drill at Yale because there's a danger there might be a fire, the fire department comes with all their red trucks. Yale doesn't pay for that. The poor people of New Haven, one of the 10 poorest cities in the country, pay extra taxes to deliver the free service of fire, police, public education, and so on to Yale, and Glenn Beck, called me onto his program because he wanted an expert on that, and that's what we did. Um, and so things, you know, I, I'm not wanting to defend or say anything positive whatsoever about Glenn Beck. On the other hand, that is the reality of what, what, what is going on. So um, it has been a remarkable experience, um, and I'll leave it to you, obviously, to judge whether or not the film uh, makes the case it wants to make and gives an interpretation. I can tell you from everything I know that the strongest part of that film seems to be, in terms of what people respond to, the explanation for how we got into this mess, a, a feeling of the historical forces that came together to produce it. And I, I've concluded from that that um, our media, for all kinds of reasons,
have been stunningly unsuccessful in explaining to the American people what in the world is going on and what is happening to them and has created, therefore, an immense anguish, anxiety, and hunger to understand. And I benefit because this film does that, tries to give a, a manageable explanation uh, that people can relate to, that touches your own life one way or another. And that it's a sobering reality that if people on the left of American politics were able to formulate, present their own analysis of what this is about, and you might f be very surprised at the response. As I do my speaking on uh, television and radio around the country, I am not attacked, I am not vilified, I am not treated. And as recently as three or four years ago, when I would go on radio and television, I would have usually the following experience. The interviewer, whoever he or she was, would invite me on probably to stroke their own sense of being open-minded and fair-minded, have one of those on the program, you know? <laughs> and I was one of those. And the interviewer would, would be polite and all that, but would make sure to let his or her audience know that you know, they weren't with me. What is different about the last year and a half is I don't have that anymore. The interviewers are with me. They throw me questions that we call in the business, as I'm learning the lingo, softballs. They ask me questions that give me a chance to say my thing. They are not anxious to show that they disagree me with me. They're anxious to show that they're with me, including my Republican Mormon interviewer in Salt Lake City. Uh, so I am finding a much different experience uh, than I have had before. Um, the upset and the concern in the American people is, at least in my experience going around the country, uh, which I do a lot these days, is very encouraging uh, and much less dire than the media would have you suggest. What's going on in the country is not just teabag parties. A whole lot of other things are happening and they're happening perhaps below the radar that many of you work with, but they're happening, and I think that it might be useful for me to let you know that, if nothing else, make you feel a little better or a little less upset. Uh, before just opening it up, and I'd be glad to answer, obviously, any questions about this, I thought a few words might be useful to you in terms of what has happened since the film was made and over the last uh, six or seven months. Capitalism is a complicated economic system, and one of the things that it has is a complicated network that ties together events in one area to events in other areas. It's even a little scary that you can have a problem in one area of capitalism, but it doesn't show up there. It shows up somewhere else. It's a little bit like what a doctor may explain to you, that if you have a pain in your elbow, it doesn't necessarily mean the problem is in your elbow. It could be in your shoulder, it could be your nerves, it could be a vitamin deficiency, who knows what it might be. But you have to understand the system that will explain to you why first this system, uh, symptom, excuse me, and then another symptom show up. Economies like that too. And what connects the different parts of the economy, of our kind of economy, is this thing called the market. And the market is this bizarre relationship, which if you've ever thought about it, or certainly if you've ever studied it, it's been presented to you as one of the greatest inventions of the human race, sort of right up there with sliced bread. Um, it can work very nicely, but it works always in two directions. The good news is it can sometimes make things happen in another area that are good because they follow up from something good that happens somewhere else. But what can they can also do is they can spread the bad news. What's happening in our economy today is that markets are spreading the bad news. When a group of people can't pay back their mortgages, the end result is to collapse the government of Iceland. That's what happened. Uh, when 
countries collapse in their economies around the world these days and governments rush in to keep the economy going because the private corporations have stopped functioning, the, the governments that try to step in, they have to get the money to do that. And where are they going to get the money? They dare not tax their people. There'd be a revolution. So they borrow the money. So people around the world who have money to lend are in a great position because every government on earth is desperate to borrow to keep itself going. So these lenders then, looking at this situation, say, oh, good, I can now lend money to the safest government, and I can go to the, the unsafe ones, the shaky ones, the poorer ones, the smaller ones, and I can say, you have to give me a lot of interest or else I'm not going to give it to you. Why do I, should I lend to you? I can lend to the United States or Canada. Why should I lend, say, to, oh, I don't know, Greece? Why should I lend to Greece? Greece is a poor country. Greece is a country with lots of problems. By the way, not problems that are all that different from many other countries. It's a little bit of a hype, but they have problems. So the Greeks, I don't know if you follow this, but Greek workers and Greek unions and Greek families have been in the streets the last three or four weeks, and they will be in the streets tomorrow and the next day in a massive movement to say, we're not going to have our wages go down, our taxes go up, and our social programs provided by the government fall apart because the capitalists around the world lent to people they shouldn't have, took risks they didn't understand or didn't report. We don't want that. And the world press struggles trying to blame the Greeks for what? For doing what everybody else does. So, it, so here, here we have an explosion in Greece. And by the way, the next country, in case you're interested, since people always ask me as an economist as if I could predict the future, what's happening? If you ever, by the way, encounter an economist who predicts the future, get away from that person as fast <laughs> as you can. Because <laughs> that's toxic and, and you know, there's no difference between an economist who makes a prediction and the lady in the amusement park who reads your palm and tells you who your next love life partner will be. You're smart enough to know that the lady in the amusement park, that's what it is. It's an amusement. When an economist talks to you, it's also an amusement. Don't ever mistake that it's something else. So I can't predict anything either. Having said that, <laughs> since it's always asked, is there another country that is about to blow up because it can't handle its problems even though it doesn't have a profile like Greece? And the answer might surprise you. It's Great Britain whose condition is, is, is worse. When the Great Depression hit in 1929, the average level of debt of an American family was about one-third of its annual income. That is, the average family owned a quantity of money roughly a third of its annual income. And you know, if you're going through hard times, having a debt makes it harder. In 2007, when the current crisis hit, the average level of debt of an American family was 130% of its annual income. We have no idea what that means. We have no idea what that will mean in terms of the length or the depth of this downturn. We have no past experience with anything like this. It is just one of the many variables which, if you take it seriously, mean that the art of prediction is fake. We have no way of knowing. But if you think that's scary, in Britain today, the average level of debt of a uh, British family is not 30% of its annual income and not even 130%. It's 170% of their annual income. The British working class in record time outstripped the American to become even more indebted than before. The British government is borrowing quantities of money that no one has ever seen before, printing quantities of money that no one has ever seen before. And around the world, everybody who owns British pounds, every government, every bank, is thinking to itself, time to leave. I don't know if some of you saw it, but usually when a 
financial story like this begins to develop, which it did about three months ago, it's usually about a three-month lag, and then it shows up in the New York Times. <laughs> so today's New York Times had a story about this, but it's, it's, it's three months late. If you want to keep current, you have to read other newspapers. The best, I mean that, seriously. The, you have to read the Financial Times, the best paper you can get. The Wall Street Journal is becoming an outlet for Mr. Murdoch. It's a different story. Uh, the New York Times is what you should read. The crisis is as bad today as it ever was. You've been hearing since March of last year of a recovery. Here's what that means. We did get to the bottom of the stock market on the 9th of March, 2009. We have had an an uptick in the stock market, risen about 40% from that time, 45%. And our banks have gotten healthier. They still have terrible troubles, but healthier. The reason this happened is that the United States government poured an unprecedented amount of money into the banks of the United States, into the financial companies of the United States, not just the banks, basically guaranteeing to the financial sector that the full faith and credit of the United States would be available limitlessly. Please remember that the American government still has on the books a virtual absolute guarantee for the debts of most of these large institutions. It owns shares in them. It guarantees their debts. It provides them with limitless credit at ridiculously low interest rates, verging on zero. It is the support. We do not have a private banking system. We haven't had one for a year and a half. Our banks are on life support of the United States government. Those banks took unspeakable risks. They knew that. And because they took incredible risks of lending to each other and to other entities who couldn't possibly pay it back, which they knew. They invented a wholly new gimmick. It's an insurance policy for loans. That's all it is. It's a, it's a way you go to a particular company, and I'll mention it in a minute, which one they were. You go to a particular company and you say, I lent money to this thing. They owe me $100 million. I'm worried, because I've done my research, they may never pay me. So I want to buy a policy that covers me where you will give me the money they default on if they don't pay me. It's an insurance policy for bonds or for credit. It could have, it should have been called an insurance policy. It wasn't. Why wasn't it? The answer is very simple, and it's what I talked about in the film. Every one of the 50 states in the United States over the years has developed an insurance commission. Insurance is a regulated industry in the United States. Why? Because insurance companies have been as crooked as the day is long for most of the history of that industry. And periodically, people blew up about it. By the way, what's the basic problem of an insurance company? You, you must have noticed that in your life. You... You send them money. Your hope is that you never need to need get any money back, which is their hope too. <laughs> Think. They then take your money and invest it and make money with it. The more of your money they take, the better off they are. And so the day may come, which happened over and over again, that you actually needed to be covered for what you've been sending them premiums for. And you went there and you said, uh, pay me. And they looked at you and said, have a nice day. We don't have the money anymore. Whereupon insurance had to be regulated because people were swindled. So we have insurances. So had they called the insurance policy for debts, these big banks that lent irresponsibly, then they would have fallen under the insurance regulations of this country. So they weren't called insurance policies. They were called something you may have seen in the newspapers, a credit default swap. Doesn't even sound like an insurance policy. It's a credit, that's all it is though, the credit default swap is an insurance policy on a debt. And companies got into that because Nobody really thought everything would fall apart because in the period from 1975 to 
two years ago, the American economy was just wonderful and growing and prosperous and there was no end to it. And so companies sold these policies because it was like free money. They would get a payment every month and they'd never have to pay. The largest insurance company in the world led the way, called AIG. So when everything collapsed in 2007, all of the banks that had lent money irresponsibly to people who couldn't pay it back trotted over to AIG here in New York and said, pay me. And AIG said, sorry, we don't have that kind of money. Have a nice day. At that point, all of the financial structure of the United States was in, in play. All over the country, pension funds, churches, corporations had these bonds that they had bought to hold their little bit of money, which were now not worth anything, and they couldn't collect on the insurance. So the United States government came in, took over the AIG company. There was no time to work out a plan. It was collapse time. So the AIG Corporation, as an independent, largest insurance company in the world, disappeared. I mean, it still exists, but it is completely owned by the United States. 80% of its shares are owned by the United States, which has pumped somewhere between 150 and 200 billion, billion dollars into it. And all that money is doing in AIG is being sent over to the people who bought the insurance policies. And one of the largest, the scandal of scandals, one of the largest companies to cash in on AIG policies, when AIG couldn't pay them, the government paid them, was Goldman Sachs, which had sold all kinds of people around the world on the great idea of investing in these bonds while the company was simultaneously buying the insurance policies, betting that these bonds would never get paid back. But that doesn't matter because you're all paying for that but keeping Goldman floating. So of course, Goldman's stock has gone back up, and we've had a recovery of the financial sector and a recovery of the stock market. They're very close together. But over the last nine months, the unemployment rate of the United States has gone up every single month. There is no recovery in the rate of unemployment. None. The rate of home foreclosures of the last nine months, up every single month. The chaos in a whole host of countries around the world, you just read a little about Greece or a little about the, is growing worse and worse. Even today's New York Times story on the financial section explains that in Britain, which is the story today, it is getting worse and worse and worse, and no one quite knows the, the British pound, which was $2, uh, two US dollars to get a pound a few months ago, is now less than $1.50 which is a, a sign of the, the, the British situation. It may well be the end for Britain. It may be the, the, the end of the British position. You know, they were a great global power like other countries sometimes are. And then the decline began, and it started in the 19, end of the 19th century, and it traveled across the 20th century. And as we enter the 21st century, no one knows. The thing that kept Britain alive in the last 30 years was the fact that we had a financial boom. London is one of the great financial centers of the world, maybe the greatest. So with finance booming, London could take off and could carry Britain. With the financial sector going down, when the market turns bad, the badness spreads. Not to put too fine a point on it, there really isn't anything in Britain. It really all, think a minute, it's a small unfertile, cold, wet, offshore island from Europe. We just are used to the British Empire, and so we think like that, particularly the United States, a former colony. But there's nothing there. If they can't run financial hustle, ah, uh, they're going to be exporters of bangers and mash. And if you've ever eaten that, you can see there's no future there. So there is no recovery, and you have all the consequences of that. 
You have a mass of Americans who keep reading about a recovery and who obviously, looking around their house and their job, understand they're being left out. Now, being good Americans, a good number of them will blame themselves. We, we, we're good at that. It's my fault. I didn't get the right job. I didn't get the right education. I didn't do well enough in school. I didn't do this. I didn't do that. But a growing number of Americans are not going to blame themselves. They're going to look for somebody else to blame. We have the first African-American president. That's, a, that's an easy one. A whole bunch of people are going to get angry at him. We have politicians who deserve folks' anger for sure, aren't doing much. So we have a time of tremendous dichotomy between rich and poor. The uh, statistics are stunning. In the 1970s, the United States was the least unequal distribution of wealth and income of the advanced industrial countries. Today, we are the most. What you saw on the graph up there is a story in which the rich got richer and everybody else had a hard time. They only got by by borrowing, but that's over. You can't borrow anymore. And so you are now having postponed the denouement, the confrontation, it's with us now. This is an extremely serious crisis. It is far from over, but the political whirlwind being set in motion now is as extreme as any I've ever seen in my lifetime in this country. And I don't think most Americans are, have yet begun to, to understand what they're in for across the board. Every institution in this country is in trouble. Every institution is cutting back, even Wall Street firms and hedge funds who are in terrible tr trouble. This is a crisis across the board. There are demonstrations across the United States tomorrow around education. Very interesting. Led by, stimulated by, and organized largely by what is happening in the state of California. For those of you that don't pay attention, pay attention. It's our largest state, and it's the state which is arguably as terribly impacted by this crisis as any. They are laying off thousands and thousands of teachers and social workers and prison guards and everything else. And everywhere across the state of California, there's now rumbling. They're mobilizing. They're having demonstrations. They've already had some. They're going to have more of them. Because there's a fight that's emerging, and I'll stop with that, which is who's going to pay all the costs of groping our way out of this catastrophe? The corporations have figured out long ago the steps they need to take to hold themselves harmless, to minimize the damage done to them. The banks have been stunningly successful in coming through this disastrous period, improving but for most other institutions, it's not that way. Every university I know of is in trouble, public and private. Now, some of them, you know, you don't sympathize with them, but Yale loses half its endowment. That's, uh, that's a lot for an institution like that. And American institutions of higher learning, which I mention only because we're in one, uh, are, are an extreme problem. We basically changed our model of higher education. We used to have a community of tenured professors in a certain relationship with students. We don't have that anymore. The overwhelming majority of our faculty are now adjuncts. They get paid nothing. And the administration becomes the boss of a core of underpaid, precarious workers with no guarantees and no security. Same thing is happening in Europe. But the Europeans have a clever sense of language so since the, the word proletariat in Europe, which has a deep socialist and communist tradition, is widespread, they had to come up with a word to cope with the new generation of people with no job security. And in Europe, it's called the precariat instead of the proletariat. But we have that here, too. Kelly girls, manpower, temp workers, all of that and all of the adjuncts, and all the people who are temp workers and insecure workers without being called that, that's, that's what's happening here. 
And with the proposals now to cut Medicare, to raise taxes, to cut social programs, I mean, you, you are facing, as the Greek people are, the question of whether you will, you, and I mean you and me, tolerate not only the system that produces this crisis, but now proposes to sort its way out of the crisis basically by shifting the costs of the adjustment on those who had the least to do with producing the disaster in the first place. That's a remarkable outcome if they can get away with it. And the struggle in Greece is a struggle every other European country is concerned about, and we should be too. The struggle there is whether or not the financial community that runs Europe can impose these costs on the Greek people or whether the Greek people will say no. Every other worker in Europe is watching. Every trade union in France, Italy, Germany, Spain is watching. Every single one. And they will make the determination whether they see the outcome. And only the least of the ironies is that the government caught in the middle the government of Greece is the government that is a socialist party government run by a member of a family that has been the leading family of socialism in Greece for generations, Papandreou. Those of you who ever followed Greek policy know that the father and the grandfather and the current prime minister of Papandreou, just to show you how complicated the world is, sat in my classes at the University of Massachusetts on several occasions. I'm just hoping he understood what I was trying to teach. <laughs> so any questions, comments, I'd be glad to try as best I can. Sir. How do you see the role of China in this whole mess uh, in terms of global uh, financial? Yes, in many ways the proverbial $64,000 question. First. Integrate, let me integrate briefly China into the story you saw in the film. In the 1970s, when this story began, when the wages stopped rising, all Americans, whether they did more work the way we described, or they took out debt, all Americans somewhere understood the world had changed. And they became very interested in finding cheap places to buy things. They knew they were under attack. And starting in the 1970s, the American working class shifted its purchasing programs, its plans. They may not have been conscious of it, but they all did it. And here's basically what they did. The entire structure of stores catering to the American working class. Of course, I have to bracket this. Here in America, we, of course, have no classes, and therefore we have no working class. So I, of course, mean the middle class. We are a population that has no problem saying that everybody is in the middle class, except for, you know, Ivana Trump or somebody else. You know, but we are all in the middle class. The, the working class of people, people who go to work every morning, 9 to 5, and live like that. So they had to change. They had to find a place to, to get cheap stuff. If you had understood that in the 1970s, that there was this sea change, which most people didn't, but if you had, if you were lucky to see what was really unfolding, and you were a country or a company, you would have said, okay, my future is, I've got to produce everything that the American working class wants to buy. A toaster, a car, a hair blow, you know, hair dryer, TV, whatever. I got to produce it cheap. The cheaper I produce it, the better my chance of getting into the American economy. And the American economy in 1970 is the richest economy in the world. The working class is the richest working class in the world. Buys a disproportionate amount of stuff compared to anybody else in the world. It's the market. The country that figured this out and went to work to produce those goods for the American people was the People's Republic of China. They transformed their society. What's going on in China the last 20 years is stunning. Something like three or four hundred million people are moving off of agriculture and the countryside into the cities. That process took centuries in Europe to accomplish for the same number of people. 
It's happening in decades in China. In, in Europe, we write books about the dislocation to people's minds and cultures and religions of that kind of move from the agricultural way of life to the urban industrial. The Chinese have managed it in 20 years. It's, it's an unthinkable thing. They developed an industry where there was none. They developed an infrastructure to handle transportation where there was none. They did everything to produce the mass stuff for the American people, which is why you're all wearing it right now. Okay? The problem of the Chinese was no way to distribute it in the United States. They don't have any stores. They don't have any networks. They don't have any wholesale retail. Nothing. What the Chinese needed was not just to produce the cheap stuff. They had to find a partner inside the United States, free of any taint of being communist, who could handle everything they produced as fast as they produced it. And they found somebody, a small, obscure, silly family born in Bentonville, Arkansas, having a little dippy-dippy department store in that part of the world. I've never been to Benton, Bentonville, Arkansas. I, I assume most of you have not. Either I'm assuming it is a small rural place in Arkansas, which is already a terrifying concept, but in any case, uh, that's what that is. But Walmart, which is what I'm talking about, obviously, is now the largest single private employer in the United States. It's the largest retail outlet in the world. There's no chance. Walmart could not have happened without China and vice versa. This was a marriage made in commercial heaven. The Chinese found their distributor. And the distributor found the way to become not just a department store in Arkansas, but the world's largest retail outlet, handling Chinese goods, which is what they did. And what the Chinese thereby did was give themselves 20 years, 25 years, 30 years, a window, during which if they played their cards right, placated the United States, gave Walmart everything it wanted, which they did, they could handle the flood of people off the countryside, which they couldn't have stopped anyway. But instead of having a revolution, as these people come to the city and can't survive, they had jobs for them. Jobs predicated on selling the output to the United States. So this is a symbiotic, interdependent relationship. The Chinese not only produce for the American market, and remember, hard work, hard work to produce an incredible amount of stuff which they don't get to consume in China. They produce for export. Very serious. They don't get to enjoy this stuff. They get rid of it. But here's the worst of it. The problem is, if Americans buy all this stuff, we send all the dollars over there to pay for it. What are the Chinese going to do with all the dollars? They're economic. They, they can't buy stuff in the United States. They don't want to, but they couldn't, they couldn't handle it anyway. No point in buying all the equipment. They, can't, they don't have the people to run it. They don't have the projects. To, so they accumulated dollars. What are they going to do with the dollars? And they came up, they came up with a brilliant solution. They lent the dollars back to the United States to enable the United States government and its people to buy the Chinese junk. <laughs> and it's important for you to understand it because you know what this is? This is a replay in reverse of a game the United States played at the end of World War II called the Marshall Plan. At the end of World War II, the United States had a big problem. We had just come out of a Great Depression followed by a war. The great fear in 1945 was that we would fall back into the Depression. It was only the war that got us out. So the end of the war, what do we got? All those soldiers taken off their uniform. They don't need it anymore. And they don't need a gun anymore. They don't need bullets. They don't need planes. Because the war is over. Oh my goodness. These, un these now demobilized soldiers, together with all the people losing their jobs in the munitions factories, they're going to be on it. What are we going to do to keep them working? 
That was the great anxiety, 1945, 46 in America. One of the solutions, there were several. By the way, the solutions are really interesting for those of you interested in the United States. Because we were in such a mess then, we did things that you couldn't dream of today. We passed something called the GI Bill of Rights. You know what it did? In 1945, the United States government said to every returning soldier, we will pay for you to go to college. All the costs. End of story. And they did. Today, that would be considered to be an irresponsible act of fiscal poor judgment. Well, we had to do that. You know why? We didn't want those soldiers looking for work because there was no work. We wanted them in school. The second thing we did is we said, OK, we've just finished a war, Europe is completely smashed, they want to rebuild, good. We'll sell them the stuff, the tractors, the machines to rebuild, and that'll give us work in America to make that stuff. The Europeans said, great, we want to rebuild, but we got a problem, we got no money. No problem, said the United States. We'll lend you the money, Sorry. we'll lend you the money so that you can buy our goods. And that's exactly what the Chinese did. They lent us the money so we could buy their goods. And so here we are in 2010, and what have we got? The Chinese have industrialized their country in two or three decades. Stunning. world has never seen that before. Hundreds of millions of people brought into an industrial base. But they're completely dependent on exports. Completely. Number two. They've accumulated so many dollars that even though they've lent them to us, they are now the largest creditor of the United States. Our government owes the People's Republic of China, somewhere in the neighborhood, public and private debt, of a, a trillion and a half dollars. By the way, just a footnote for you to think about. At about 4% interest, that means that we as a people, you, are paying taxes to Washington, $60 billion a year of which is delivered as an interest payment to help the People's Republic of China modernize the Red Army. So on behalf of the People's Republic of China, I wish to tell you, thank you. Thank you so very much. If that strikes you as bizarre, that's just one index. We owe them big time. We need them big time. You know why we need them? Because the entire structure of our economy now depends on cheap goods for Americans purchased at Walmart. Imagine what employers would face by the working class here if we said, no, 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 no more Chinese goods. Oh, good. Instead of a shirt for $9 that you can get in Walmart, you're going to spend 40 at another store because it's made in the good old USA. Uh-uh-uh. Our industries depend on low wages that can only survive in a regime of cheap products. And China is the number one producer of cheap products in the world. Nobody else gets close. So yes, we now have a situation in which we depend on the Chinese. They have been crucial to the whole story we've told here. To get the richness of it, the United States government is fighting three wars. Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. That we know of, uh, who knows. But at least three. Those wars are not paid for by taxes because they're, they're already unpopular, they would become, it would be impossible to continue. So the money has to be borrowed. Who are we borrowing it from? The People's Republic of China. The People's Republic of China is opposed to the American presence in all of those countries. It finances that presence that it opposes. Contradictions. When, a, when an economy is caught up in these kinds of contradictions, one of the lessons is, don't imagine that this is under control. The notion that this is all being worked out and that Mr. Bernanke or somebody else has got this under control 
that may flatter these folks and it may pander to the PR firms they hire. It is not the case. Here's the last point about China. Here's what we know. Over the last year and a half, the world has not been buying Chinese goods the way it did before. There has been a major cutback, which would have to be the case. Every economy is in trouble. We can't buy this Chinese stuff, including our own. During the last year and a half, the Chinese report constant production, growth in production, more output. All right. Every serious economic researcher that I know cannot resolve this issue. How are they doing this? How are they continuing to employ all those people, prevent riots in the street, keep everybody working, produce more stuff when they're an export-dependent economy and the export markets have dried up? There are two contending answers. One, that they have not only achieved all the other things they've achieved, but they have in a time that nobody could ever dream of, a year and a half, shifted from an export-dependent economy to a domestic economy. That is, they, they have their own people buying all this output. For me, I think that's crazy. I don't think that's possible. I don't think no society could do that. They can't do that. That, that takes generations. It certainly takes decades. You can't do that in, in months. Second option, they are making the greatest gamble imaginable. They're keeping everybody working. They're literally holding, stockpiling, warehousing unspeakable quantities of output in the hope that the world economy will correct itself soon enough and far enough that they can unload all that stuff. And they don't have many more months to wait because if it doesn't happen, they can't keep doing this, in which case the kind of economic downturn we've had will look like a picnic. Nobody knows. There are enough anomalies in the statistics reported by the Chinese government to fuel the suspicion of many of us that this is an extraordinary exercise, the biggest gamble any country we know of has ever taken to try to get through this. But you know, their reasoning might be, if we don't do this, disaster is assured. So we'll do this, cross our fingers, and perform whatever the Chinese equivalent is of a Hail Mary pass <laughs> and hope that something happens. Other folks, questions, comments? Yeah, ma'am. I've been saying since the early 1980s that the global banking system is going to collapse. Do you agree with that? Yeah, the question was, uh, the, she says that she's been thinking for quite some time now that the global banking system uh, is going to collapse. Well, the answer is kind of yes and no in that torture kind of answer that you have to give to questions like that. It can't collapse in the sense that that's not a bearable, politically bearable situation. Banking, think of banking like the oil in your car. It lubricates everything. It, it's much more important than that little liquid that you see in a can because it spreads all through your car and makes all the moving parts do their thing without burning and destroying one another. And banking has to exist. The firms have to be able to borrow money. They have to be able to handle the fact that the money coming into them has a different schedule than the money they have to pay out, and the banks carry that through, et cetera, et cetera. So, a collapse of the banking system is technically impossible, or to say the same thing another way, if the banking system were actually to collapse, then that would be the least of your problems, because everything else would have collapsed with it. So having said that, I don't think that kind of collapse is in the offing, because that, that's not an, a bearable outcome, barring total mayhem. What has happened, however, is that whole sections of banking activity have either transformed themselves completely or dropped out of existence because it's too dangerous. You know, I don't have the time to go into it with you, but there have been all kinds of transactions that used to, to take the time of thousands of people on Wall Street every day, well-paid people, to manage money. They're gone. There are no such instruments anymore. Auction rate securities, for those of you who pay attention, that doesn't exist. 
Billions of dollars were transacted every day up until a few months ago, and no dollars are done now. Let me give you another example. One of the staples of the American banking system was lending money to local folks in every town and village when it came time to buy a house. You know, when you get, oh, you get old enough and you get married and you want to have a family and you want to have a little house of your own, you don't want to live with your parents or with roommates, you know, you that point in life. So you go to a bank. You don't have the money. You go to a local bank and you borrow from the local bank so that you can do that. Uh, that in, that's gone. We don't have that in the United States anymore. And the reason basically is that the, the banks have no money or do not have any confidence in your ability to pay and have been badly burnt recently. So they're not going to do it. So what happens at that point? Panic in Washington. Why? Because that's a central part of our economy. We're going to have an unspeakable collapse of housing prob, uh, prices if we don't have people buying homes. I'll give you an example. There are 55 million households in the United States that have a mortgage right now. That's the number. Out of that, seven to seven and a half million are delinquent, we call that. They're not, they've, they're not paying. They can't pay. There's no historical precedent. This is unbelievable, this number. 15%, roughly one in seven of our, of our mortgage house can't pay. Okay, so banks who lent them the money are not getting paid. This is a catastrophe for these banks. They're not getting their money back. So what the bank does is it seizes your house. That's the collateral. You're not paying on the house. The bank gets the house. The problem is the bank doesn't want the house because what's going to do with the house? It's a bank. It's not a real estate dealer. Moreover, it takes months to go through the paperwork of a foreclosure and to seize the house and to deal with it. During those months, the thing you're holding is losing value because there's no market for housing in America. So the bank is watching its loss get larger. Well, looking at that, which every bank in America is looking at every day right now and been doing that for a year, they're not going to lend quickly to anybody. So when you read in the newspaper that banks aren't lending, of course they're not lending. They're not going to lend. They, you can give them all the money in the world, which we've been doing. They're not going to lend the money. That would reproduce the very disaster that got them into this situation. They're not going to do that. Well, the government is freaked because if there's no one buying mortgages, excuse me, no one buying houses because they can't get mortgages, and that's how most houses are sold, we're going to have a, a fall off the cliff of the house. Why is that important? Well, first of all, if the price of housing is going down, no one's going to build any more houses. So all the industries, furniture, wood, paint, plastic, appliances, all the other industries are going to collapse because there's no market in the housing sector to buy their stuff, number one. Number two, the only property that most Americans have is the house. If the prices of houses go down, you're traumatizing the working class. They're losing the one piece of wealth they have. And God knows what they're going to do. They're going to stop buying things because they're going to be aware, because the newspaper have it every day, that the value of the one thing they own is disappearing on them. It's not a bearable thing. So how are we going to handle this? We said to the banks, you notice this for the last seven months, Obama has said it, you should be out there lending. I want, I'm, I'm angry at you, you're not lending. This is a complete waste of time. They're not going to lend. And they haven't. So what did the government do? Here's what the government did. It said to the banks around the United States, lend out on the mortgage, because here's what we're going to let you do. As fast as you give $300,000 to Mr. and Mrs. Smith to buy a house in Tarrytown, New York, just to pick a place, as fast as you do that, we, the government, will buy that mortgage from you. So the bank says, okay, here, Mr. and Mrs. Smith, here's $400,000 to buy the house. Then the bank, within minutes, takes the piece of paper, the debt that the Smith family has to pay back the $400,000, say, over 15 years. It takes that piece of paper and it sells it to the government, which commits in advance to buy them all. 
Over the last two years, 97% of all mortgages in the United States have been sold to the government. The United States government is now the banker of the housing industry. That's how it works. Were the United States government not to do that, you would see the collapse of, of those of you looking for an apartment in New York would find it be one third the price it is now in three weeks. Right? So to prevent the collapse of all of that, of the real estate empires and all the financing wrapped up with it, the government stepped in. It's by the way a corrective for those of you who think the government only helps the banks. This is a system. You can't just help one part of it. It's a system of interconnections. You have to help multiple parts of it. And in this way, the government stepped in, helping the banks by buying these mortgages as fast as they write them, but also making it possible for people to get a mortgage who otherwise could not get one. But it's another sign that we are holding this economic system together now with you know spit and pieces of paper and hoping somehow, like the Chinese, that this will kind of pass, that this will get through these hard times. And that's what it all is. It's all cross your fingers and hope. That's very irrational. I mean, how, how very irrational. Well, there have been folks, not to scare you, but there have been folks who've looked at this kind of economic system for a long time and concluded, to make it simple, that human communities can do better than this economic system. But that's a scary thing to talk about because it has been pejoratively labeled as socialism and all the rest of it. Uh, and you can see the scare factor, the scare value of the word socialism by the way it's thrown around by Mr. Glenn Beck and uh, Sarah Palin and others who find anything that is troubling for them, socialism, but it seems to work, it gets people upset. But as long as we as a nation are unprepared to question the system, we live with its results. Yeah. Um, you did a very good job of explaining the societal reaction to wage stagnation, but why did wage stagnation to begin with? Good, good question. Why in the 1970s did the wages stop going up? Five minutes, okay, we we're running a little bit out of time. But I, I, I can answer this one. There are basically four things that happened in the 1970s. And, and I mentioned four, not because it's only four, there were many others. But I, never, I don't want you to think there's some key thing that happens. The way the world shifts and changes is usually as a result of a confluence of many different things. So I'm gonna give you four. First, the 1970s was the time of the implantation of a radical new technology, the computer. It displaced millions and millions of people. Just think with me for a minute. Instead of having 40 people in the supermarket every three months to measure how many boxes of Rice Krispies and went off the shelf, how many cans of soda, you now have this little scanning system. As you check out your stuff in the supermarket, a computer scanner lets somebody 50 miles away looking at a computer terminal know exactly how many boxes of Rice Krispies are left, how many cans of soda need to be ordered, etc. So we suddenly, in a very short time, the 70s, brought the computer into the core of our production processes everywhere. And it radically reduced the need for workers. So in the language of economics, the demand for workers went down. The second thing that happened in the 1970s was the following. When we came out of World War II, every competitor of the United States, economically, was destroyed. Germany, Japan, Britain, Spain, France, Italy, you name it. They were all destroyed. We were completely alone. We could produce the way the world couldn't. We could set any price we wanted because there was no competitor who could under-compete us. From 45 to 70s, we lived a charmed existence, a special time in American history of profitability, wealth, no competition. By the 1970s, that period was over. The Germans and the Japanese, leading the way, but other countries too, had figured out that if they were ever going to have a place in the sun again, they would have to outcompete the United States. They'd have to produce what the United States produced better or cheaper or both. 
And that's what they went to work to do, and they did. That's why you drive a Toyota. They went to work to produce the key commodities, cars, televisions, and all the rest, so that we don't have it. And American corporations were unprepared and stung. And to compete with them, they decided, if you can't beat them, join them. And American began in the 1970s the massive movement of jobs out of the United States to places where they were cheaper. Cheaper workers, less rules, less environmental protection, less cost to doing business. And if you move jobs out of the United States at the same time that you implant a technology that replaces people with machines, you've now got two reasons why the demand for labor goes down. Because you're hiring foreigners instead of Americans and fewer Americans because of the computer. But we're not done. Those two reasons. Two more. One. For a whole host of other reasons, something was happening to women in the United States. The 1970s is the women's liberation movement. Very important. It was a social movement, and it said to millions of women, don't be anymore just a housewife, a mother, a homemaker. You can, you ought to, you should have a job out there too, in the paid labor force, outside the household. And millions and millions of women, of course there had been women doing that before, particularly poorer women, African American women, and so on. But millions and millions of women who had conceived of life in the house now wanted to have a job outside. So you had them moving into the workforce by the millions at the same time that the number of jobs were reduced. And finally, because of the United States' role in the world, because of the profitability and, and prosperity here, a number of third world parts of the world experienced very severe economic decline. And they did what always happens. They lost people who came here looking for work because the situation in their own countries was terrible. And those people arrived. The women and the immigrants looking for work the computer and the outsourcing or the export of jobs, limiting the number of jobs. Under those circumstances, the employer could do what had never been possible before, to say to the American working class, I'm going to make you work harder, but I'm not going to have to pay you anymore. You're lucky to have a job at all. Up until then, one of the key reasons why we had the 150 years of rising wages is that this country always had a labor shortage. We had a labor shortage for a number of reasons. One, we killed off all the local people when we arrived here as Europeans. Well, it's a problem. You shoot them and you kill them and you can't hire them. They, they don't work well when they're dead. And then we didn't have enough. We were very successful, very rich country, good soil, good climate, a lot of good things. We were able to grow quickly. We were always running out of workers. And even if we had some workers, they were always running away from a crummy job because they could get free land. Why was it free? Because we got rid of the Indians. So a worker who you didn't pay enough to, I'll see you later, Harry. I get my land in Kansas or Montana or someplace else. So what had to happen was we had to always deal with a labor shortage, which is why those of you that are Americans can't go back more than two or three generations, and you weren't. Waves of immigrants has been going on since the Civil War, even earlier if you think about it. We always had to bring people here. A continuous labor shortage, for all these reasons, is why the wages went up. It wasn't the goodness of our employer. It was a condition that made it necessary. And that set of conditions changed in the 1970s. And the trauma that still afflicts the American working class, like all traumas that happen to you, is worse if you don't cognize it, if you don't think and talk about it. It's like suffering some kind of abuse when you're a child. You need help to be able to talk about it as a way out of it. We still haven't had a national conversation about what it means that the wages stopped going up in the 1970s after 150 years. So we're a nation that is living through it, but can't discuss it. And that's one of the reasons fantasy explanations begin to develop. It's the Arabs. It's the Muslims. It's the black people. It's the immigrants. You can see people are figuring out what happened here if they don't blame themselves. It's a very dangerous situation. Anyway, thank you very much for your attention and uh, hope to see you again.